All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. We're just thrilled to have you here tonight for engaging our learners lesson lear lessons learned while teaching Japanese. Hi, um, I'm Elena Kamenetsky. I am the Japanese teacher at Eastern High School in Louisville, Kentucky. I teach Japanese one through four, and I am also the actual teacher of the year for 2021. Hello everyone, and my name is Jessica Haxey, and I am the supervisor of world languages for New Haven Public Schools in Connecticut. And I'm a former Japanese teacher for about 20 years. I taught Japanese before my current position where I've been for seven years, and I'm the president of ACTFL for 2021. So because we have uh, such a large uh, audience this evening, we were not able to have a traditional sort of chat or even allowing people to uh, raise their hands and speak because the webinar function doesn't work that way. So instead, we've invited uh, some teachers to that who had registered to be part of our live studio audience, which is just a throwback to my childhood, I know. But thank you to all of them for being here and you'll be hearing from them throughout. We really, we did try to represent a lot of languages other than Japanese, since Elena and I are going to be uh, talking a lot about Japanese this evening. So today we're going to be starting our discussion by talking about how we use the most appealing aspects of Japanese culture, along with the aspects of Japanese language that our students find the easiest in order to draw them in to our classes and then show them how they can be very successful at Japanese early on and, and all along. And then that is also how we keep them engaged throughout as they might start to encounter some of the more challenging aspects of the language. So those are the things we'll start with and then. And then we're going to move into discussing what are the specific challenges of teaching Japanese language to our student body, which is mostly native English speakers and how we've been forced to sort of adapt some teaching strategies to meet those challenges, which we feel are successful teaching strategies that are good for teaching all languages. So as you watch this, student, this presentation, we hope that you'll see basically three themes begin to emerge. To engage with our students, we use lots of culture all the time. We use a lot of real world language and we spend a lot of time scaffolding for success. So we'll be explaining what we mean by all of those as we go, but we think that these are things that you'll, you'll see as common themes throughout. We really feel that our job is to help students fall in love with learning languages in general, and of course, in love with learning Japanese in particular. And so we make sure that we do all of these things in order to really build that feeling of success and feeling of I'm good at languages and I love learning languages in our students. So first we're gonna talk about what is it about Japanese language and culture that most appeals to our students? How do they end up in Japanese class in the first place? So the first thing I found is that a lot of my students are interested in the types of things that can be sort of um, described under the umbrella term of cool Japan or cool Japan. So Japan's cool cultural exports, things like anime and manga, and you know um, the music, especially like the rock music, the pop music, the idol groups, and you know some cultural things that they already know about, like Japanese cinema and like you know ninja and samurai and stuff like that. And other things that we find students are interested in is um, osushi. Years ago, you couldn't get a student to uh, touch a piece of sushi when I started teaching, and now um, all of them seem to have either had it or they're aficionados of it. Uh, some students are interested in kimono and design aspects of Japan. Others are interested in origami and enjoy doing it and may have learned it in other venues and, and have connected it to Japanese. Others may have seen uh, cherry blossoms or other images of uh, sort of the beauty of Japan. And I'm always constantly surprised at sort of the types of Japanese cultural exports that my students have been exposed to and are interested in. Like nowadays, it's not that unusual to find not just a sushi bar, but you know, Japanese restaurants and Asian grocery stores. And a lot of my students have had experience with Japanese food beyond sushi and sashimi. A lot of my students know Japanese martial arts. Um, they're interested in Japanese fashion, like modern fashion, street fashion, Japanese punk fashion, which I am learning is a thing. 
Some of them are interested in the landscaping and the gardening. Some of them are interested in the religion and the philosophy. Um, and some of them are just really, really interested in the history of Japan. But, I, but what we found, if we ask our students, what do they really want to learn in our classes? Ultimately, um, we found that they'll almost always answer that they want to learn real world Japanese skills. And usually they'll start by saying they want to learn how to speak Japanese. And we think that if you ask your students, you'll, you'll, some of you have probably found the same thing. So as a result of this, we incorporate culture into our classes every single day in ways both big and small. And we will be talking about that in more detail a little bit later in this webinar. So we are going to pause for a moment and ask our, our live studio audience here, what about your language and culture most appeals to your students? So we'll start with Eli Beardsley, who's the Span a former Spanish teacher, now a world language instructional lead. So if, when thinking about Spanish, Eli, what about Spanish language and culture has most appealed to your students? Sure, and again, thanks for the opportunity to share. Um, in Louisville, we've got a, a really great um, diverse city here. And so uh, a lot of students are very interested in authentic food. And so maybe uh, this is a new fa fun fact for everyone, but Louisville actually has the third highest uh, Cuban population in the United States. So there's a lot of authentic food choices, uh, real menus, interactions in Spanish. Uh, music, again, I knew you all mentioned that too, but from merengue to bachata, uh, to pop music and crossover artists that are doing music in English and in Spanish. Um, festivals are a huge draw as well to learn why we celebrate certain things, how they celebrate them. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is from the English learner lens, most of our schools have a, a, a large number of English learners, uh, Spanish speaking. Here in, in Louisville, we got about 51% of our English learners are Spanish speaking. So from that social aspect, um, they can talk with their, their peers in, uh, in Spanish as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a, it's a wonderful perspective on it. And um, Lan Lin um, is a Chinese teacher at Hopkins School in Connecticut. Can you talk, tell us what appeals to your students about J Chinese language? Sure. Thank you, Jessica. Students in our program think learning Mandarin is pretty cool because the language is spoken in 13 countries with about 909 million people speaking it as their first language. So besides learning the language, they're also interested in its culture, history, economy, politics, arts, and literature. Many also believe that it is important for one's career to learn Mandarin given the most companies now prefer applicants who are bilingual or multilingual. Thank you so much. And um, Lori, Lori Lavar Pierce, the, our French, German, and Latin teacher. Wow, from Mississippi. Can you can you give us some insights into why students are interested in those languages? Sure. And what's interesting is that it's slightly different for each of the different languages. So for Latin, my students most frequently tell me that they want to learn Latin because they want to know about the science vocabulary. I teach at a, at a school for math and science. So a lot of my students take advanced science classes so that to build vocabulary or they're gonna go into a scientific field. For French, overwhelmingly it is, it's just a beautiful language. I love the culture of France. I want to go to France, um, but there's, there's an emotional aspect in it. And with German, interestingly enough, more frequently I get that I know somebody who speaks German or I have a family member who speaks German. I want to go to Germany. Sometimes I'll get some science connection there as well because there's a lot of engineering stuff that happens in Germany. Um, but it's interesting the differences in the three of those. Thank you so much. So as you listen, I hope that you think about your language and then we, we encourage you to use these things that students have told you to then engage them and pull them into your classes and keep them interested in your classes. So next we're going to talk about what aspects of the Japanese language are the easiest for our students to handle. So first of all, Japanese is very easy to quote conjugate because we really don't conjugate in Japanese. So uh, if you want to say I go or we go or you go or they go, it's all the same. We say ikimasu, 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 ikimasu. 
Or if you want to say, I went, we went, you went, they went, it's all the same. Ikimashita, 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 ikimashita. So students find that pretty accessible and easy. All right, Japanese is a phonetically simple language. Um, it's syllabic and it has the same vowel sounds as Spanish. And there are of the Japanese writing systems, which we'll get into in a moment, there are two that are basically completely phonetic writing systems. So we have some hiragana up on this slide. How do you spell yakitori? Ya, ki, to, ri. How do you spell Hiroshima? Hiroshima. How do you spell wasabi? Wasabi. So you say exactly what you see in the writing and you write exactly what you hear in the language. And um, Japanese does not have some of the features of other languages that are difficult for English speakers, such as tones. Japanese also has lots of cognates with English. So lots of words like kappu, aisu krimu, hambaga, banana, orenji. And lots of those cognate words also happen to be a lot of the words that you use with lots of Japanese one type of language, Japanese one language exercises and themes and things you do in the classroom. So it's really easy to start with vocabulary that's familiar to students. And just sort of generally speaking, Japanese is pretty easy to start. You can get going with speaking Japanese fairly quickly. We have a, an informal form that's pretty easy to get going and master. Um, or we, or you could also use we have a desmos form we we call it, where which is fairly can be, can get you by in either informal situations or a little bit formal situations. We also have some phrases like really, uh, so desu ka, and it is, isn't it? So desu ne. And if you know those two phrases, you can get through a Japanese conversation about 50% and, and people will think you're, you're pretty much understanding what's going on until they ask you a question and then you have to figure out how to answer. Uh, so, and small talk is also fairly simple where, you know, oftentimes there's an expression that's said and then there's an answer. So you, if once you've got that memorized, you can participate in some conver conversations. And I think probably most of you find the same with your languages. Um, it, you can give them some tools so that it's easy to start and then you'll they might find later on that when it gets complex it gets hard to master so what do we do we get students speaking early with the easier language with lots of those simple like set phrases greetings very simple conversation connectors and the types of themes like you know food and clothing that has lots of cognates we yes it include cognates whenever possible and we praise and encourage our students when they speak. So we give them that experience of success. And we also respond to them in the target language. So if they say something like, anime ga suki desu, I like anime, you can respond with, watashi mo anime ga daisuki desu, like, oh, me too, I love anime. And you're just sort of repeating what they said and reinforcing the language. And also you are being very encouraging with your voice and your mannerisms. So you're helping them feel like, hey, I'm really communicating and I'm having success in the second language. Thanks. Yes, so now we're gonna talk about sort of the meat of this presentation. What aspects of the Japanese language challenge our students the most and how have we adapted our teaching to meet those challenges? So we'll start with challenge number one, the fact that Japanese is a character-based language. Uh, so just to give you a quick uh, overview, Japanese has basically three character systems that are, are in play. And then I'll talk to you about this fourth one listed here in a second. So we have kanji, hiragana, and katakana. Kanji are the characters you see in Japanese that are, are derived from China. There's about 10,000 of them in existence, but in Japan, you need to know about 2,000 of them to be considered literate. They're, they're pictorial in that they represent a meaning when you look at them. Um, but that sort of only gets you so far as a learner because it doesn't always exactly look like the thing that it's picturing, right? So up here, this is the character for um, dog. So, you know, it doesn't exactly look like a dog. Uh, and uh, so that is a challenge for our learners. And also one character can have multiple readings. So it could be that it's read one way in certain words and it's read another way in other words. So then we also have hiragana and katakana. There's 46 characters in each. These are more like our alphabets. 
And they're the hiragana are used to write usually Japanese words that are derived from Japan, that are origin in Japan and morphology. And they're very phonetic. So usually one, one character is one syllable and it's either a vowel or a combination of a consonant and a vowel. So this is e nu written here. I'm not sure if you can see my pointer. This is e nu and then katakana is the same set of sounds as hiragana, but these are used to write for borrowed words, like words that are cognates from English. And also onomatopoeia, things like the sound your stomach makes when it's hungry, peko peko, and words like that. And so you'll see a lot of katakana in uh, manga books because they'll be doing the different sounds that things make. Uh, so for example, this is dogu, which would be the end of the of if you're going to try to buy a hot dog in Japan, it might be called hot dog, and so you would see dog written like that for a hot dog, but inu written like this for a real dog. Uh, and then finally, we've got uh, uh, romaji, romaji, which is the way we, oops, forgive me, which is the way we uh, type in Japanese. So we use English letters to type in Japanese, and then, um, but there is also sort of a set of rules that you need to know to do that. And in addition, Japanese dictionaries work differently based on the strokes in the characters. And like it said, typings works differently. So in one sentence, our students might encounter kanji, hiragana, and katakana. So it's color coded in this sentence. This sentence says, Tanaka-san wa ice cream ga daisuki desu. So teacher Tanaka likes ice cream a lot or loves ice cream, but you've got kanji in red, hiragana in blue and katakana in green. So because of so, these challenges, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that's okay, <laughs> we overlap. We're, we're, we're starting from zero with many of our students. So we have to build the three-legged stool of literacy from the ground up. What does that mean? It means that with our students, first we need to connect sound to meaning. Oh, I should not say first because we have to do all three of these things at once. All right, we have to connect sound to meaning. So when you say inu, they have to understand that means dog. So you can have a picture of a dog and you can say inu, inu, inu. You connect sound to written representation. So when you say inu and you show the students or write on the board or whatever, the characters e inu, inu, inu. So connecting sound to written representation. And we have to connect the meaning to the written representation. So the word, the written representation inu has to, the students have to understand that means dog. So sound to meaning, sound to written, and what was my last one? <laughs> meaning to written. <laughs> so what do we do? It's, you gotta use visuals like all the time, as much as humanly possible. You gotta have the pictures. And you know, sometimes it takes time to find the bright piece of clip art or the right picture that you can actually use because it's Creative Commons, but it's, as much as possible, you have to be connecting the spoken and the written language with some sort of visual representation. Um, it's really important to do matching activities. You know, they're rote, but they're also kind of fun. And you have lots of different aspects to match. So you can match like the image to the word. In this case, the word is undo or exercise. You can match the Japanese word to the English word. So exercise to undo. And then in a language like Japanese, where you have multiple writing systems in play, you can match one writing system to the other writing system. So for example, undo in hiragana to undo in kanji. And then because matching activities don't have to be rote or dry, there are lots of real simple fun games that you can make out of them. Like Japanese has a game called karuta where somebody, the teacher, will say something and the kids have to slap the card that matches that, whether it's the image or the word, or in the super traditional version of this game, it's that the caller says the first part of a poem and then you know the players have to slap the second part of a poem. That might be way too advanced for Japanese one. You can just do like hiragana and katakana. Um, but I found that you know the kids absolutely love this, no matter how many times we do it. They seem to never ever get sick of it. So, you know, any sort of fun physical game that involves some sort of aspect of matching can be really fun and engaging for your kids. I think it's really important when you're sort of starting at zero with literacy to read out loud. You know, when you have text, you can read out loud to the kids. 
read out loud directions. And I'm a super, super believer in making my students read out loud. I, I know it's not the trendiest, you know, teaching method, but I do it a lot. So a lot of times if we're going to do a reading comprehension activity before we get into the comprehension questions, you know, I introduce it, activate whatever background knowledge or vocab they need. And then I'm like, okay, I'm gonna give you a set amount of time, like half an hour or, you know, overnight, we're gonna come back and do it tomorrow. And then I'm gonna start calling on you to read it out loud. And that gives the students to, time to prepare, but they also know they're gonna be on the hook to read out loud. And I found that as a teacher, the most valuable aspect of that is I can tell in an instant whether when a student is reading, they are actually comprehending the meaning and understanding the meaning of what they're reading, or they're just saying syllables. And you can hear if they're just saying syllables, if they're not processing what they're reading at all. And then from the student end, it really does force them to sort of, you know, check their own comprehension to make sure that they understand what they're reading, that they know where to pause their voice, that they know where the boundaries of the words are. Another fun aspect of written Japanese is that there are no spaces between words. So <laughs> it's extra important to hear that read aloud because a student who understands what they're reading is going to be able to pause their voice in the right place. A student who does not understand what they're reading is not gonna pause their voice in the right place. And then, oh, Romaji or the Roman alphabet. So um, what I try to do with the Roman alphabet is I have learned that I do need to familiarize my students with it or else they will not be able to type when it's time for them to type Japanese. So the rule that I try to follow is I never make the students produce Romaji, but I do make them convert Romaji. So with Japanese one, a lot of times when the students walk into my classroom, I will have a warm up up on the board. It's like, here's an English word, here's Romaji. I want you to write down the English word and the Japanese. So the hiragana or the katakana, I will specify which one. And then, so they're, they're looking at the Romaji and they're writing the Japanese characters. And then at the end of that warm up, they have a list of vocabulary that's relevant to whatever we're going to be doing today. So it's two birds with one stone. Now, what I found this year with my online classes is that I stopped doing the warm ups because I had so little time with the students and I had like no Romaji content whatsoever in my classes. And then that came back to bite me when I realized that the Japanese one students had no idea how to type because they didn't know the rules that they needed to produce certain Japanese characters with their keyboards. Right. So that sort of forces us to have to incorporate it even though we might not normally want to. The second challenge that we're going to look at tonight is this idea of sentence construction. I think this one's fairly common to um, many of the languages we have online tonight. Um, but basically, Japanese sentences are constructed in a different order than English sentences would be constructed. So if we look at a sentence like this, Yoshi-san wa hamburger ga daisuki desu. It basically, here we've got Yoshi. This is the meaning of this word here. Here we have hamburger. And this expression, daisuki, like I think I mentioned before, is sort of like, it's, we use it sort of as love, but it really is big like. And then we have des at the end, which is the verb to be, so it functions as a sort of copula here. So as you can imagine, that's not the same order as what we use when we speak English. So we hear a lot of yoshi-san daisuki hambaga, which of course amounts to Yoshi, big like hamburger. Or here's another example. Uh, Yoshi-san wa hamburga wo tabete imasu. Yoshi, hamburger, is eating. So of course, when students want to express this to us, they might instead say, Yoshi-san tabete imasu hamburga. And I suspect if we could see the Japanese teachers in the gallery right now, we would see a lot of nodding heads, you know, thinking, oh yeah, if I hear that one more time, right? Uh, so so um, actually, I taught pre-K through fifth grade Japanese for many years, and we don't see that problem quite as much at the younger levels because the younger levels are still in that process of developing syntax in different languages, and they're really open to having, you know, to really going with whatever the input is that they have heard. And so I rarely saw a lot of students mixing up sentence order, interestingly. But once you hit that window where their brain starts to change, and if they're starting Japanese after that, 
I think Elena has a little different experience. Yeah, I, I mean, my students' English instincts are so strong that I've had plenty of times where I will give them a sentence that is already written out with like one blank word and it's like a fill in the blank. It's like, this is a sentence. It exists. <laughs> this is the sentence. And they will take that and rearrange it. Like just rearrange the order of the sentence that I've already given them. And because their, their instinct to put the verb in the middle instead of at the end is so strong. <laughs> so kind of like Yoda, right? The English is strong with this one. Yeah. <laughs> So in order to help students internalize correct sentence construction and sentence order, we provide lots and lots of natural input. So we might do this through songs. Um, we certainly do it through teacher talk. You know, whenever there was a lull in my class, even when I'm handing out papers, if we're in person or if I were messing with technology while we're online, I just keep speaking Japanese and doesn't matter what you're talking about. Um, or, and sometimes I would even just start singing if I ran out of things to say, just so that they're constantly getting input because we are, so, we're one of the only sources of that input um, to them each day. So it's important to surround them with language. And you might also be showing them things like infographics and poetry, you know, things that are recorded so they can listen over and over and stories. So they can really start to develop a feeling um, for natural language, the cadence of language and to that ear to know when something sounds right and something doesn't sound quite right. And you only develop that with lots of input. We also scaffold sentence creation with things like lots of picture dictionaries um, use where you have no English, it's just the picture with the word underneath. And then uh, many of you might use sentence starters, but in Japanese, we often give sentence enders. So these are the enders for, you know, like that big like and like and so so and don't like. So students could use these two together to create sentences fairly quickly. Um, we also might give them something like this. It's almost like a mathematical formula, fill in the blank, right? So choose a person or animal choose a thing and then choose a verb. So for example, the cow or the ox, the cow, uh, kanji writes, right? Ushisan wa kanji wo kaiteimasu or kakimasu. Uh, and uh, we have these other sort of particles, we call them here, but don't worry about those tonight if you're not a Japanese teacher. And also we do a lot of building of understanding by using really tactile activities. So give them cards that have the different parts of the sentence on it and then have them move the cards around physically in order to feel where they go. So in person that might be, you know, where they might even cut it out themselves and do it. Um, I like to have it pre cut out so you can do it quickly. Um, online, you can do the same thing where you just have those words on a Google slide and they still have to at least drag them around themselves. So when they do pull it into the correct order, again, it would they would be moving it around and moving it around. And finally, they would get Yoshi-san wa hamba ga ga daisuke desu. And then we would go over it as a group um, and ask them to read their senses out loud like Elena does, and then woo, praise and excitement. But most importantly, I think with this, uh, the sentence order thing is that you just need to stay focused on the message, especially when students are novices. If they say something like Yoshi-san, daisuki, hambaga, if they're saying it wrong, you'd still sort of understand what they meant. Yoshi really likes hamburgers. And so instead of um, making them feel bad or making them restate it properly or anything like that, we just re we, we react, right? Oh, Oh, you know, like Elena said, I like hamburgers too. I love them or I don't like them. I'm a vegetarian or whatever it might be. And then make sure that you sort of collect those errors and then uh, in, your, in your teacher mind or on your checklist and revisit them another time, sort of as a whole class or when you meet with that student to talk to them about it, but not in front of everyone and not immediate error correction. All right, so the third type of challenge that we're gonna talk about are the expressions that don't translate between languages, um, the way that language can be gendered in Japanese, and the sort of funky rules about levels of formality. So, and the first part, the expressions, you know, this is true of every language. There are things that students want to say in their native language when they want to express it in Japanese, like I miss you is something that comes up a lot in my class. Students are like, how do I say I miss you? I miss you. And in Japanese, you don't. Instead, you say like, I tie this, I want to see you. How do you say good luck? You don't. You say, gambatte kudasai. You say, try your best. Um, 
Some idiomatic expressions don't translate. Like in English, we say kissing up to someone. In Japanese, you say gomasuri or polishing the sesame seed. And then what do you say when someone sneezes in Japanese? Nothing. It's more polite to say nothing because it would be rude to point out that they've had a bodily function. So, And then um, Japanese language can be very gendered. It can be, not always. So for example, when receiving a president, a president, a present, um, a man or a woman might say, urashi, urashi, I'm so happy, urashi. A woman might say, urashi wa, which is a very feminine way of saying, you know, I'm happy. A man might say, urashi na, which expresses a lot more masculinity, or a man might say nothing. So, yeah, and that's something that, um, as a non-native speaker, it's sometimes difficult to teach about, especially because it's something that in the target language is currently in a state of flux. Like um, one of the textbooks that I use for my Japanese four students has a little section where about like feminine and masculine commands. It's like, you know, when a woman gives a command, she's more likely to say nasai. And when a man gives a command, he's more likely to express masculinity by saying like an e construction, like tomare, damare. And according to some native speakers that we talked to, that is also changing. And, you know, a man will also say a nasai command. So, you know, it's difficult. You do need to teach about it so that the students are aware of it and they know what it sounds like. They know what they're hearing when they hear it, I guess I should say. But they also need to be aware that it's not universal. Okay, and then we get into <laughs> yeah, in-group, out-group. So one of the funnest things about Japanese is that um, the level of formality changes depending on the situation. What that means is the humble the circle of humility and humbleness can expand or contract depending on the situation. So for example, if I am a student talking to my parent, okay, I and my siblings are going to be uchi, I'm the humble group in blue. I will show respect to my parent by addressing them with respectful terms, even if I'm saying something like, what's for dinner? Okasan, like mom, what's for dinner? I still have to use like the respectful term. Now, let's say that I'm a student with a picture of my family introducing my family in front of Japanese class. Now, the humble group is myself and my entire family, including like my parents and grandparents. So when I say like, this is my mom, her name is Deborah. Now I'm gonna use the humble term for my mother, haha. So now I'm using humble terms to refer to my mother because my mother and I are both in the humble group and everyone else is in the respectful group. So situations like that, you have to really practice with the students. So what do we do to address this challenge? As much as possible, we need to use authentic texts for input, even starting at level one. So, you know, um, YouTube videos are great, you know, especially like blog videos, stuff like that, where even if the students don't understand all the language, they'll be able to hear things like greetings. They'll be able to hear like the casual good morning and the formal good morning, and they'll be able to recognize that and start to get an ear for when you use casual and when you use formal good morning. And then talking about real life, um, it is important to showcase different perspectives on these issues from within the target language. So for example, on the left of your screen, I have a screenshot of a video, um, Ayashi Ninto no Ichi Nin Show, and it's this Japanese woman who identifies as liking masculine fashion. And she posted this nine minute video about all the different personal pronouns, all the different ways she says I, depending on what the social context is. So she's like, when I'm on social media, I use this I. When I'm in my day job in an office setting, I use this I. When I'm talking to my family, I use this other I. So she had some really interesting perspectives and discussions. Um, also showing students that there's, you know, not universal agreement on, how shall we put this, the way that gender should be expressed in Japanese. Um, on the right of your screen is, a comic that I recently discovered, Boku ga watashi ni naru tameni, or if I were to translate this in English, the tale of I masculine becoming I feminine. 
And it is the diary of a transgender woman who's Japanese and she has to go to Thailand to get a sex change operation. And it talks about her experience like being transgender and how she experienced that in Japan. And then as a teacher, it's important to stay informed of fads and trends and actual cultural shifts when they happen and also be aware of when they're not happening. So something that I heard a lot when I started teaching was um, I started to hear Japanese women who are in the entertainment industry. So women who are like singers and actresses started to use the masculine I, oku, even though they were projecting super femininity. So an example right here is, um, this is from a YouTube video of a Japanese idol named Lilian, who's very, very, very feminine, like very petite, tiny, very girly, but she uses the masculine pronoun boku. Boku suki datta yo. And I had to think like, is this evidence of an actual cultural shift happening in Japan? Are young women using boku? Or is this a Japanese idol trying to be quirky and unusual for the sake of sticking out from the crowd and being quirky and unusual? And the answer seems to be the latter. But could this be an actual cultural shift someday? Maybe, I don't know. Better stay on top of it, consume authentic media. So our final challenge that we'll talk about tonight is this notion that our students are interested in talking about culture that is far beyond, beyond their language abilities, uh, especially when they first come to us. So Japanese has a lot of really interesting high interest products, as you've just been seeing from Elena. There's a lot of really interesting and different practices from what our students are, are might be used to. And there's a lot of really fascinating perspectives uh, in Japanese culture but our students might not have the language to discuss those yet. So what we do is we, first of all, surround them with visuals. As Elena said, visuals, visuals. We surround them with visuals at all times. So even if uh, on day one, we're talking about a car in Japanese, we're gonna use a Japanese car picture to show them. If we're talking about restaurants, we're gonna use a picture of a Japanese restaurant. If we're talking about cities, we'll use a Japanese picture so that they start to at least internalize the way you would if you were a child growing up in Japan and just sort of seeing these things as your day to day. Then we also build their cultural awareness through having those physical experiences of Japanese culture. So these are my students um, pounding rice for New Year's. And uh, these are some more of our students at Maloney School in Waterbury, uh, Connecticut, doing a summer festival where they're gonna do some dances and then maybe eat some shaved ice afterward. So all those things that maybe if you grew up in that country, you would experience and you wouldn't really know why you were doing those things, but you eventually you would be able to talk about the perspectives behind them. But when you're young, you're just, know what the thing is and maybe can talk about what you're doing as you're doing it. And also we encourage you to take a look at the uh, reflection piece of the uh, intercultural can-do statements on the ACTFL website. So right on actful.org, um, if you go to resources and publications, you can access the Necessful Actful can-do statements. And part of those can-do statements are a set of intercultural communication can-do statements. And they come with um, a, a suggested way that you can help students to reflect on culture at home in English. So an example would be maybe giving them a T-chart like this, where after they watch a video in class at home, they could reflect on what they saw in the video, and compare that to what their family does and then reflect on how that um, gave them some new insights onto themselves and others uh, as they did that. And finally, we just feel that like our job, like we said at the beginning, is to help them fall in love with the culture. So whatever it is that we need to do to do that, these are some students doing a Japanese athletic festival years ago uh, in Waterbury. And uh, Alina, what are your students doing here? They are making onigiri. There you go, oh, that's, a, that's a top favorite one right there because that's something they can make the rest of their lives. It's so easy. So we're gonna pause again here um, and ask our, our studio audience to just give us a quick example in your language. What's a similar challenge you've seen in your language to some of the ones that we've talked about tonight? And then how do you address that challenge? What's a, a best practice that you use to address it? So um, Ryan, Ryan teaches Burmese, Thai and uh, Laotian at Brigham Young, and we're gonna ask him to, to talk first. Sure, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, 
I think that a unique challenge for Burmese learners is that virtually every grammatical function word and grammar structures are different depending on the medium. So spoken Burmese will have one structure and written Burmese has another. And then likewise in Thai, very similar to Japanese, there's different lexicons or pronouns and things like that for discussing royalty or for changing the formality level. And so this shows us that the mediums and also the modes of communication are very important. You know, presentational, interpretive, and interpersonal communication all have unique challenges in each language, and we can help learners the most when we expose them to all of those modes um, and give them exposure and experience in a variety of contexts and mediums, you know, like using authentic texts, um, allowing them to give short presentations uh, at their skill level and things like that. And throughout all of those varieties of modes and mediums, it's important to match the text to just above their current level. So we're stretching them but we're still maximizing their comprehensible input and their success in language production. Oh, thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, Angela, let, let's hear about Spanish, which is a similar challenge you see in Spanish. A similar challenge that I see in Spanish is just really helping my students to understand the cultural representation and just really helping them to see that Spanish encompasses such a wide range of speakers. And I don't want them to feel that there's this monolithic, stereotypical Spanish speaker. And so I use a lot of different visuals of people that look like them, people from communities that they may not uh, initially think are native Spanish speakers. And I really try to help them see the diversity in the Spanish language. Wonderful, thank you so much for that. And um, let's see, Lan, can you tell us what it's about Chinese? What's a similar challenge you see? Sure, thank you, Jessica. Uh, learning Mandarin Chinese tones right is actually a big challenge for English speakers. Besides providing many authentic materials for students to listen to and practice with, I've found that it is helpful for the students to listen to their own voice recording, identify the errors, and compare their speaking with the voice from the native speakers. Students really gain confidence in speaking the tones right with lots and lots of opportunities to practice with the recordings at home, practice with the teacher and with their partners in well-designed activities that involve different modes of communication. Thank you, wonderful. Yes, I find the tones of Chinese very challenging, even as a Japanese speaker, it's completely different. And Aviva, tell us about Hebrew. Well, one challenge that Hebrew has is directionality because we read from right to left and vowels are under the consonants. So, and all text, authentic text after about something for third grade won't have any vowels at all. So um, it's, it's really difficult for students um, when we try to use authentic infographics and, and things like that. Um, and it means that even if we line them up in front of the room, we want to have them lined up from right to left. If we have a calendar, we want to make sure that we get a Hebrew calendar that goes from right to left, because otherwise they're going to do it the way they've done everything else, left to right. Right, just like we were talking about earlier, the English is strong in them, right? That desire to put it the way they're used to. Well, thank you so much, all of you. And just thank you again to everyone in the studio audience. You all, it's been so wonderful to have all of your perspectives on the different languages. So we hope that uh, during the, our uh, talk this evening that you, you saw a lot of those big three themes we talked about earlier, culture, scaffolding for success, and uh, real world language, because we really do believe that when students experience those constant feelings of success in language class, they will fall in love with learning languages in general and in love with your class in particular. And finally, we do have a oops, we do have a really wonderful um, learning series coming up. We've had uh, a number of learning series in the past uh, years, and this new one coming up is guiding learners to intercultural citizenship, interdisciplinary units to link language and culture and content. And uh, if you've seen the book, Teaching Intercultural Citizenship, they've got the three authors of that book who are uh, going to be developing those uh, modules with you. And also there's an opportunity to um, have time afterward uh, with them working on things yourself um, uh, if, in more of a sort of a personalized way, this optional add-on on the bottom where you can develop a unit plan or three lesson plans and get direct coaching and feedback from the authors. So that's a pretty cool opportunity. And that's available on our website as well. Well, thank you everyone. 